always wanted to be a hero. It was a hero who achieves the seemingly impossible. The hero who lives a life of extraordinariness. And about a year ago, I had a glimpse into what that might look like. In March last year, I completed an event called the Four Deserts Challenge. And in the process, helped to raise close to $200,000 for most of children's causes and charities. The Four Deserts Challenge itself is a series of food races that take place in the four great deserts on this planet. It began with the Sahara race. The Sahara is the world's largest hot desert. It covers an area of about 9 million square kilometers. And that's 10% of the African continent, or if you would prefer, 13,000 little Singapore's. <laughs> the temperatures we experience while racing out there, 51 degrees Celsius. Now, if you try to wrap your head around that, yes, that's quite hot. <laughs> the second desert was the Gobi Desert in China. We were racing in a region called the Turpine Basin. This Turpine Basin is the second lowest point on Earth. And what that means is that its shape prevents heat from escaping and it traps it. So much so that locals call the place the oven. The next desert, the Atacama in Chile, South America. The world's driest desert. So dry that some parts of it have not seen rainfall ever since record keeping began. It was high and it was dry. We were racing at 11,000 feet. And to imagine what that might feel like, think about running a marathon while breathing through one nostril. And the last desert, the fourth desert, the bottom of the world, Antarctica. It's a polar desert. And as a continent, it's the world's largest, coldest, and southernmost. There's an Antarctic saying that says that at latitudes of 40 degrees south, there's no law. And below 50 degrees south, there's no God. And at below 60 degrees south, where we were, there's no common sense. <laughs> so in the midst of all that brainless craziness, there was a foot race to be run. And the task for the four deserts is quite straightforward. You run, walk, limp, crawl, usually in that order, 250 kilometers. And you do that while self-supported. That means anything that you need, all the clothes you need, all your food, all your gear and equipment goes in your rucksack. It's the equivalent of piggybacking a one-year-old child throughout the whole race. But it was here, against this backdrop of putting human endurance to the ultimate test, that I received my schooling in the hero's journey. And one lesson stands out for me. And this lesson comes by way of the Sahara race. We are on day five in an overnight section of what is known as a long stage. And time is past midnight and under what is almost a full moon. I find myself racing alongside Chris from England and Pink from Korea. And by this stage, our legs, backs, our joints have taken a beating of over 200 kilometers. Our bodies are not so much screaming up for rest as they are begging to be laid down to fall asleep. And so it takes everything that we've got to just keep awake, keep upright, and keep moving, much less move at speed. And to compound matters, Peg was nursing a leg injury that was threatening his race. But he's hanging on in there, refusing to throw in the towel. But his injury means that he has to move at a painfully slow pace. And so the three of us get together and we decide that in this individual race, if we were all to make it to the finishing line, we're going to get together and we're going to have to give each other a leg up. And so what we did was Chris and I would move along, chatting with each other to keep ourselves awake, 
and then we'll wait for pig to catch up, have a little rest, and then keep moving again. And by this constant repetition of move, wait, rest, move, wait, rest, we make it. To the next checkpoint, and subsequently two days later, across the finishing line. And there we are, at the Giza of Pyramids of Giza, and I'm meandering my way through the competitors, and I chance upon the Korean contingent. And from that group, Peg emerges, he spots me, grabs me by my shoulders, and literally presents me to his compatriots. And all of them yabbering away in a language that I don't understand. But what I notice is uh, the cameras come up, and everyone's going, ooh, ah, wow, picture. And I'm looking at Peg, I'm thinking, what's going on? Why are you telling them? And he turns to me and looks me in the eye and says, that is. That overnight section of the long stage, my legs were killing me. But you and Chris refused to give up on me. You guys kept me going. You are my hero. Now, it would have been so tempting to see myself as the hero who arrived and saved the day. And perhaps I was an accidental hero. But that picture would not be complete. You see, in ultra endurance racing, we say that the people at the back of the pack are the real heroes. If you are the back of the pack, you will be out there on the course far longer than everyone else, sometimes up to three times longer. If you are the back of the pack, you will bear the brunt of the terrain, the temperature, and the toughness of the race far harder than anyone else. If you're at the back of the pack, you'll most likely be carrying a heavier bag, nurse more physical injuries, and face more mental demons. People at the back of the pack are the true heroes of such race. And in reality, hey, what's the hero? And in that one critical section of that overnight race, the three of us happen to get together to give one another a leg up. And what did this lesson teach me? Well, I learned that being a hero is not a solo journey. It is the guidance, the support, the encouragement of other people that take us all the way. I learned that a hero is defined not by what we accomplish, but what it takes to get there. That in a big, long race, it is a small, little step take us all the way. And I learned that as I began to grow up a little bit, that my own satisfaction and fulfillment comes not so much from wanting to be a hero, but in helping create heroes. So how do we move forward in all this? What do I take away from all this? Well, my next project will be the 10 and 10 and 10. And that is to run 10 marathons in 10 days in 10 different countries. And that means that I'll run a marathon in country number one, hop onto the plane, get to country number two in time to run another marathon the next day, and on and on and on. Is it tough? I think so. <laughs> Might I fail? There's a chance. But is there a point to it all? Absolutely. And what's the point to it? Surely there must be a purpose beyond the call of adventure for all these brainless craziness. And my purpose came from my own realization that I was not the only kid growing up wanting to be a hero. I think every child grows up wanting to feel good about himself. Every child wants to feel empowered, to stand on top of their world. But the thing is, many of our children already find themselves at the back of the pack. They find themselves at the back of the pack socially, economically, academically. And they could do with a leg up. They could do with some heroes in their lives. 
but not those of pop culture, media, or entertainment, but real adults who they can look up to and trust. Real adults who would inspire them. They need real adults who are involved in their daily lives. They need you. 10 in 10 in 10 is about making heroes of our children by putting hero mentors such as yourselves in their lives. So I do the running, you do the mentoring. I give all I have to do 10 marathons in 10 days in 10 different countries, and all I ask of you is that you give 10 hours in a month, well, actually, in a year, to mentor one child. That is the equivalent of exchanging one session of Facebook surfing. <laughs> for the opportunity to truly connect and share with someone. Ten hours in a year. I think we stand in a space of great ideas and inspiring people. But these need to result in something inspirational. I think it's not enough to be inspired. We need to be inspiring. And inspiration is a big, huge project made up of little, small, special moments. The mother trees are once said that if all to look at the messes, I will never act. But if all to look at one, I will. And so I will end today with one question to you. In the spirit of inspiration, in the spirit of ideas worth spreading, and worth doing. What is one step that you will take today?